Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Benjamin Quinn, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm so excited to welcome you to tonight's event with Andrew Martin and Benjamin Nugent discussing their story collections, Cool for America and Fraternity. Tonight's event is part of our ongoing virtual event series. We're so fortunate to be able to continue the work of bringing authors and their writing to our community during these difficult times. Every week we'll be hosting events via Zoom, and just like always, our event schedule will appear on our website at harvard.com, where you can also sign up for our email newsletter for more updates. This evening's event will conclude with some time for your questions. If you'd like to ask the speaker something, locate the Q&A button wherever it may live on your Zoom display, where you can submit all your questions. We'll get through as many as time allows. If you go to the chat section of this presentation, I will shortly be posting links to our website where you can purchase copies of tonight's books. If you already have copies of the books or would like to contribute to the series and our store in a different way, I will also be posting in the link in the chat a link to our website's donation button. We greatly appreciate any and all support you were able to extend us at this time. And lastly, as you may know, if you've participated in large virtual gatherings lately, technical issues might come up we apologize in advance for that. If any technical glitches do occur, we will do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. And now I am so pleased to introduce tonight's speakers. Andrew Martin's first novel, Early Work, was a New York Times notable book of 2018 and was included in several best of the year lists featured in The New Yorker, Book Forum, and several other places. His acclaimed stories and nonfiction have been featured widely in publications such as the Paris Review, the Atlantic, the New York Review of Books, Harper's, and elsewhere. Benjamin Nugent is the author of American Nerd, The Story of My People and Good Kids, a novel. The winner of the Paris Review's 2019 Terry Southern Prize, honoring humor, wit, and sprezzatura, stories and nonfiction have appeared regularly in other notable publications, including The Best American Short Stories, Tin House, and N Plus One. Tonight, they'll be discussing their story collections, Cool for America and Fraternity, two books that bear the individual and indelible marks of their makers, expanding previously visited places, characters, and concerns, yet share similar orbits. Across these books and the stories they contain, characters make art, go on benders, break up and break down, and form the kind of essential connections made only possible through fond yet ramshackle conditions, solemn and heartfelt confessions, and unsupervised debauchery. In, the period, in this period where liveliness and creativity can be so hard to conjure, these books are enormously appreciated. We're so honored to host this event tonight. Without further ado, I will now turn things over to Andrew and Ben. Cool, thanks so much, Ben. Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah. All right. Hey, ben. So, so I'm gonna um, read first. Um, and then Andrew will read, and then we're just gonna have a conversation and um, hope you all will ask questions, whoever might be here. All right, so this is from the last story in my book, Fraternity. Um, it's called Safe Spaces. I'm just gonna read the first paragraph. Claire's roommates threw her out on November 3rd for falling behind on rent and hogging the Xbox. During the next three weeks, she lived in other people's houses. She missed the Xbox, but couch surfing was like a game. She had to not smell like coke sweat or wipe her nose all the time in front of her hosts. And then she had to figure out the magic words that would make them let her stay. At her aunt's house, she praised a samovar. Ding, ding, times three nights. At her friend Abby's mom's house, she praised a sword and held it at the invitation of its owner, Abby's mom's boyfriend, a former military school instructor and slipped it back into its wall-mounted case, resting the blade and pommel in the felt slot. Ding, ding, times two nights. In Abby's mom's boyfriend's gap-toothed son's house, she praised the smell of cows as the first snow of winter fell through sunlight and country music played on the stereo. Doodle a ding, times four nights. In Abby's bed, she and Abby had sex, and Abby asked, why won't you look at me? but she couldn't make prolonged eye contact with Abby, times one night. In Abby's mom's boyfriend's gap-toothed son's ex-wife's house, she <laughs> told the ex-wife about the gap-toothed son's girlfriend, shared two lines with the ex-wife, watched her clean the living room, and held the ladder so she could wipe down the candle flame-shaped light bulbs in the chandelier, times two nights. 
The cocaine made it even more like a game because when she found a place to sleep, she didn't really sleep. She dozed two or three hours and bolted upright. She wanted to stay in bed forever and also to get up and break things, but she never slept all day or broke anything. Just lay there half awake until the sun rose. Her alarm went off and it was time to go to work. By mid-November, she was a master of the whole routine. She felt no fear. But then pilgrim hats and turkeys appeared in the windows of the stores and the game froze. Oh man, that's so good. Wow, thank you. Um, thank you. I really like it. Um, I'm gonna read uh, the very beginning of my story called The Changed Party, um, which is the very rare story I've written that's from like a, a parent's point of view instead of like from the kid's point of view, even if the kids are in their <laughs> 30s. Yeah, um, yeah, well put. Um, so I'm gonna just read the first couple pages of this. I was eating a plum over the sink when my eight-year-old daughter, Amanda, slipped into the kitchen and started picking through the trash. She pulled out some crumpled plastic and pieces of old food, examining each item carefully before setting it on the counter. My plum dripped dark red drops into a coffee cup filled with water as I struggled toward a casual intervention. What are you doing there, honey, I said. Checking to see if I threw anything away by accident, Amanda said. She held up a yogurt carton and shook it deliberately over the counter, sending tiny purple splatters across the tile. Are you missing something? I don't know, that's why I'm looking. The logic was just short of airtight. Amanda had woken up in the middle of the night a few times in the past month, coming into our room to tell us she was worried she'd left something behind at her day camp or at a friend's house. Lisa or I would walk her back to her room and go through her possessions, accounting for everything of value, but it didn't seem to settle her. And now this was an escalation. Honey, I think you need to stop now, I said. There's nothing in there. You don't know, Amanda said. Trust me, I said, I've been alive a lot longer than you and I've never thrown away anything by accident. I threw my plum pit in the bin for emphasis and brushed the trash she put on the counter in too. Amanda watched accusingly and picked at the back of her scalp. Why don't you go find Patrick and I'll take you guys to the arcade, I said. It was raining again and we'd already seen two loud, terrible movies. Fine, she said and slumped out of the kitchen. We'd been at my mother's beach house on the Jersey shore for three days with four still to go. My wife, Lisa, and I were there with Amanda, plus our friend Mike and his wife, Victoria, and their son, Patrick. My mother was on a bus tour of the West with her no longer new husband. Lisa and I had recently re reunited after a six month separation and hosting our old friends was serving as a kind of official acknowledgement that we were recommitted to this thing. For a variety of reasons, this was only going medium well. Dun, dun. <laughs> Thanks, man, that was great. I love that story. Um, so you stated that that is an anomalous story for you in that it's about the perspective of the, it's written from the perspective of the responsible people, right. it's written from the perspective of the parents. Um, the subject you return to over and over again in this story collection of yours, Cool for America, is the perspective of the people behaving childishly beyond the age at which one would reasonably be expected to do so. And um, very often the forms of misbehavior are very self-destructive and often destructive of other people. Um, what do you think draws you to, um, to the perspective of the person doing wrong, the perspective of the person self-destructing? I mean, I think for a start, they're the active person. And I mean, I think like on a craft level, and we kind of talked about this a little bit over the year, how long have we known each other? I don't know. Um, that, that there is something to be said for, for sort of the, I don't know, the, the, the appeal to, the appeal that comes with a character who is active in some way. And I think um, for my characters, a lot of the time, they're they're doing things because they don't know what else to do um and they're sort of uh enacting their their inner lives in these sort of dramatic epic ways because they are either stressed out or bored or freaked out by life and so instead of um sitting quietly and watching tv like most of us do when we have those feelings um you know they, they go on a bender or they 
do a line of cocaine or, or, you know, just like start causing havoc in the world. Um, and I don't know, I, I think there's also like something going on with our, the age that I'm at, a, a, a few of my friends are, a lot of my friends are starting to have kids and so they're having, you know, like, but they have babies or little kids. Um, I think like you always sort of feel yourself positionally as the, the kid acting out maybe until you actually have kids of your own. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't know what draws you, we, we've had really interesting conversations about like what draws you to characters who are seen as bad. You know, you're writing about fraternity brothers who like socially right now in America, like might be like among the most like categorically reviled people. Um, but, but it seems like, well, I don't know. I don't want to speak for you, but like what, what draws you to thinking about these characters and, and is that part of the attraction or, or not? Sure. I mean, I think there's a couple things. Um, one is that I never know what to do if I feel like I've stumbled upon subject matter that's innately beautiful. Mm. As soon as like I'm looking at like a pretty village in like windswept, I don't know, <laughs> depths of Asia, like something that like a different writer would pounce on as like a beautiful subject matter. I feel totally lost because I feel like one of my most important formal tricks is to use lyrical language for something generally considered disgusting mm. and very cold language for something generally considered beautiful or transcendent to have language cut against content. Yeah. And so I feel this great license to write lyrically when I write about frat boys. As long as you're writing about their disgusting life, you know, their disgusting houses with like the mold and the sink and like the Red Sox boxers and what have you, you can wax lyrical. And I still do that. Like my most lyrical moments in writing are like describing the haircut of like a skater boy in 1994. <laughs> How it resembles like the helmet of an infantryman or something. And like, you can't do that if you don't have an innately ugly subject to work with. No, it's true. Well, I was also thinking about how the, the safe spaces that you read from is the one story that's like centered around a female protagonist. Yeah, yeah, it's the one written from a female perspective, yeah. And I wonder how that, does that change the, I've been thinking about it myself because I feel like I have a few stories that are close third person female characters and then a lot of first person male characters and I I don't know do you think it changes the way that you write do you think it changes your do you, do you notice yourself changing your mode or changing your way of thinking about characters in that way or is it does it feel like of a piece with the other stories um I think it does feel different to me in that because um the way I think about women is different from the way I think about men. It's not that I think they're innately different from men or that I think that their minds are different from men. It's more that I regard them through a different lens, through the lens with which I regard men. Mm. So assuming the perspective of a female character feels much more to me like having a crush on someone or falling in love, which is generally a little bit different from how I feel when I'm assuming the perspective of a male character. The structure of identification is different. And while writing safe spaces, I experience, even though like Claire, the character whose perspective is, is, it's in is, is queer and likes mostly women and would never be actually someone I would ever be in a romantic relationship with. Uh, the process of just trying to assume her perspective felt very much like falling in love. And it doesn't always feel like that um, in every story. Yeah. I found, I, I've felt that I think when I write from a female perspective, maybe sometimes because there's like more innate or not innate, there, there's, a more, there's a physical difference between that character and like my usual sort of like characters who are more, who look more like me on a, in a superficial way that I sometimes feel like I can like be more truthful or something uh -huh. like that I can be like, I can smuggle in autobiography into female characters in a way that I wouldn't feel as comfortable smuggling an autobiography because it's like, oh, look, I'm protected, you know, like, even though that's, that's yeah. 
as it's an, it's an illusion. It's all like stuff that you need to like get yourself to write and like. It's, it's just what oh. makes you feel safe, right? You feel yeah, exactly. safe by putting it in. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think there's a kind of distance one wants from one's characters, right? And yeah. one often one's up feeling there is that distance. I mean, one method is to write across gender, as we just said. But I think another thing I see you do is in, you you choose the moment in which someone who might be functional at most moments of their life, like these often aren't people who are really abject in life in general in your stories. They're not people who are in jail. They're not people who are looking back on a life that's been totally gutted and ruined and there's, there's no turning back. They're often people who are quite talented and like together in some respects of their life, who have gone to good schools, et cetera who are in their worst, lowest moment. And that's when you're choosing to write about them. Um, and I wonder sometimes if that affords you a kind of distance. You can kind of say, here I am writing about you in my living room and you're far away from me right now and that you're acting like a wild animal. Yeah, I think it does because, I mean, honestly, like in my, I feel like an ungenerous way if I'm being ungenerous with myself sometimes and I think, uh, like it does, it feels like, if not a crutch, then like, then like it feels, I don't think it's easier necessarily, but there's certainly more drama in a moment when, when someone is, is, you know, I feel like I've got three different stories that open with, I just broken up with my girlfriend yeah. or, or wife yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah. Because it does feel like those moments reveal character in ways that, that feel easier to access than someone on a on a good day or a regular day sure. um i mean you you did that great interview with um george saunders and and he i can't remember if it was in your interview or, or another one that i read that he talks about sort of like feeling uncomfortable with with joy with like happiness and like always feeling the need to like put a thumbprint on it or or to like to, to have someone slip on the ice and hurt themselves if they're like walking down the street on a beautiful winter day or something like that. Um, and, and there's sort of like, I, I feel this like hope in myself for, for like growth, <laughs> like in myself as like a, as a writer to, to, to be able to handle the subtler modes. Right, um, right. Someday you'll be able to write a story in which someone is, is just gardening. And I mean, the story <laughs> you read from is, is from the perspective of a responsible person. So you're clearly capable of doing it already but you see yourself growing into happiness in, in fiction. Maybe, I mean, it's like, there's, there's the, the cliche, people claim it's Tolstoy, but who knows, like that happiness writes white, you know? Yeah. Um, and uh, and that, that maybe that's true, um, that, it, that it's just like, how many like happy characters can you really name in, in fiction? Um, this, was, this was leading me to wanna, oh, I had a really good, follow-up question for you and now i'm blind oh yeah the question about patience like the question like we were, we were talking the other day about like sort of both of us i think have a tendency and it's the tradition we've sort of been brought up in as writers is this like very tight like every line is is either funny or sharp or sort of like active in some way and these characters are often in extremists and you know you, you we both write stories where you're sort of that are kind of often like locked in language wise. And I wonder like, as a reader, as a writer, what you think about sort of the idea of, of patience or the idea of like sort of the, the tight grip on a story versus a looser grip and how you think about those things. Sure, I mean, I think like a lot of people, um, when I was young, I demanded constant stimuli. A story very much needed to recharge me every line or every other line or every paragraph. And I would read people like Alice Munro and be like, why is everybody pretending that this is a good story? Even, <laughs> even Marilyn Robinson, like a masterpiece like Housekeeping. I remember reading it when I was trying to read it when I was about 23 and being like, why do people pretend this book is good? I don't get it, I don't get it. And um, the journey of course is away from attention deficit disorder or, or something, away from that sort of like must press and entertainment pleasure center in me, every line. Um, however, I know that there are writers whose entire mature aesthetic is built around that. And George Saunders is very proud of the fact 
that he is someone who does write with entertaining in every line or every, certainly every moment again and again and again. And that's, that's how his most truthful writing comes out. He will write more honestly if he thinks about entertaining you than if he thinks about how can I show a character growing into maturity. That isn't the most honest writing for him. Um, and so it is a personal thing about what brings out your most honest, interesting work. But I will say that your most, one of your most moving stories for me is with the Christopher kids, because only by the end do I have a sense of what is happening uh, because of that great Alice Monroe style flash forward. And I, I hope you don't mind some spoiler alerts. May I spoil your story for, for 30 people? Um, so so the, um, basically there's this brother and sister engaged in all kinds of unruly, druggy behavior. The sister is younger. She's already been to rehab a few times. The brother has managed to stay out of rehab, but he's essentially dragging her back into addiction slowly throughout the story. Um, he doesn't think much of it. He's just been dumped. And so he's in this very selfish place. And then you flash forward and you see that in some sense, he's nearly killed his sister. That on this night, um, the accidental murder of one sibling by another sibling has taken place in a kind of attenuated, indirect, unintentional way. And I find that devastating. I find the end of that story totally devastating. That we look back retroactively and we're like, my God, like this was a slow motion murder we almost watched. Um, you know, in his kind of like slow encouragement of her to like, come on, participate, do these drugs with me, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and I found that, and I, I wish I could do that. Um, I wish I could have the patience to do that in a story. And I'm curious how you did it. I mean, that, that story required real life patience. Right. You know? and, and it was, it was, it was such a lesson to me, but like a hard one to learn in that I had written the sort of main body of the story, um, you know, relatively quickly over the course of a couple of months. And then, and thought I'd like, this was a pretty good story. Like it's sharp, it's punchy, it's funny, it's sad. Like, and, and I thought I had licked it. I thought it was done. And like originally for, for like a couple of years, it ended with them presenting this like um, rock to their mother for Christmas. And the mother says like a rock. <laughs> so not as good as your ending that you eventually got. And it was just like, you know, yeah. cut to black, like a rock, how right. thoughtful, like get it, like they're assholes. Um, yeah, that, that sucks compared to what you, you were <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, and then like, I, I kind of knew it didn't work or I just like had, there was this part of me that just like knew it wasn't, good enough and I sent it to a few friends and they kept being like, yeah, it's not like, it's good, but you know, there's like something missing here. And, and so finally I was like, I guess I got to keep writing. Um, yeah. And just sort of pushed it forward. And, you know, sometimes there was like even more to it. And like, I had one version where it has like a really terrible, like surrealist, it's a wonderful life kind of ending where they like come no. to the hospital and people are like playing the piano oh, and like singing Christmas carols. And I was like, one friend of mine was like, you oh, nailed man. it. It's great. And I was like, I don't think you're, I never, never show <laughs> anything to that friend. ever. <laughs> That's so lame. I'm sorry. But I mean, no, I, I mean, I write a million lame endings to get one good one as well. Do you, do, do you, do you write past the ending or how do you, I've never asked you about this kind of. No, crap. I just write shit ending after shit ending after shit ending. Mm -hmm. Um, it's somehow when something is really important, I like have to have 80 bad ideas. Um, like I've had so many bad tattoo ideas in my life that like, and, and I think an ending is, is the same because it's the most important thing. The pressure is on. It's what you want to be permanent. What's you want to be- It will last forever. It, it will last forever. Um, and, and so I have to write so many shitty ones. I have to write, you know, if, if it were a tattoo, it would be like, I don't know, like, you know, like a neutral milk hotel tattoo gotten late at night in the East Village in, in 2003 or something, you know, just like terrible, um, terrible ideas, sentimental. Um, and um, one of the things that I had to learn how to do was to listen to a story rather than dictate to a story, mm. um, to try to say, this story is going to tell me what it wants and I cannot come to it with any um, idée fixe. I can't come to it with any notion of what it is. Um, and that humbling happened over embarrassing myself with my terrible endings, like over and over again. 
And do you think it was because you were too set on the meaning of the story? Because I was trying to convey meaning mm -hmm. rather than just say what action would feel like a kind of living creature like flying closer and closer to you rather than meaning something. Like yeah. it's something I tell my students, like if you look at the canonical like MFA stories, like the ones in Jesus' Son, like do, they, do those endings mean something? They don't. I mean, like the really canonical ones, like, you know, and you, you ridiculous people, you think that I can help you. They don't, you know, they don't a affect a story's meaning in any describable or, or cogent way. Yeah. Well, I was also thinking about the way that your book, like whether, because I feel like there's so much pressure on stories. I feel it on individual stories to each, like have their own meaning and have their own me mechanism that works. But something that's like great that I found about writing a novel is like there's sort of less pressure in some ways. And also in the way that I ended up constructing my book and the way that your book's constructed, there is like sort of, there's a, there's a full arc and there's like a narrative and you sort of get multiple chances to see these characters and so you don't have to like say goodbye to them forever in, right. in, in each story and I wonder once you started realizing you were writing about a community whether that changed the way you thought about um, story construction like oh well I don't need to tell everything about Oprah I don't need to tell everything about Nutella because like we're gonna see them again and I can like sort of save save some or or I don't know was it just exciting to get to like continue to enrich them as you went forward with more stories about them? What it was for me was a generative constraint. It was like, you've already written about a guy who does this thing or has these characteristics. You need to find a contrast. You need to find a different kind of guy or you need mm -hmm. to find a different kind of person. You need to find a different angle from which to view this house. And the constraint gradually grew narrower and narrower and narrower because I'd exhausted more ways of looking at this community. I'd exhausted more possibilities for frat boy characters. Um, and I really like a generative constraint. Um, I think the most beautiful pieces of writing are when you can feel that the author has worked themselves into a tiny little box and something happens that's comparable to what the White Stripes did for years as musicians, which was, you know, the drummer plays something very simple. There's one guitar, they're singing. The guitar always kind of sounds the same. And somehow uh, from there you find freedom. I feel like that's the great paradox. It's from, from hemming yourself in, you eventually become free. I find it very hard to remember that as a writer because well, like, yeah because you start over with the blank page and it's like, you could do anything, you know? Right, it's to get away from that terrible situation where, where you feel that you could do anything. Right. And save you from like having to think about what you're gonna do. Like that's where freedom comes from. Yeah. Because you can't do everything. You can't do anything. You, you, can't, can't. you can only do like one tiny thing. And so, um, and so yeah, like, like giving yourself a very narrow field to work with. Yeah, so important. Um, which may be, you know, um, I feel like people um, often accuse you of uh, writing about the same milieu um, over and over again. And I'm curious how much of that just feels like you're using lived experience um, and how much have you kind of set yourself a generative constraint? Is it a formal decision? I'm going to get these other options off the table so I can exhaust the possibilities, look at it from different angles of this, this one sort of set of humanity that I've chosen to focus on, which, which your um, many um, fans in the critical establishment will call millennials, well-heeled millennials, angsty millennials, th these terms that are reductive but not factually inaccurate, right? Yeah, I, right, I, and, and it was a, it's a funny thing because I, I certainly wasn't actively thinking about I'm gonna write a, a book or two books now about about millennial, you uh -huh. know, millennial artists or artist adjacent or artist, yeah. you know, would, would be artist people. Um, I think as as you have talked about with with fraternity, it was like I wrote a couple of stories and suddenly it just felt like I, I had found like a a, a vein yeah. that that was just like so rich with stuff I wanted to write about. Um, and for me, it was the, the, the two stories about Leslie were written before 
the novel early work. Um, and those stories to me when I wrote them felt like I'd like sort of busted something open and just like found a character that I really loved and cared about and like a sort of way of thinking about the world that, that felt like I could explore things I wanted to do and, and I could like kind of use use situations that I'd been thinking about but couldn't figure out like how to how to write them um I don't know it it, it, it is so much the hard the funny thing about writing is I think like y y the subject matter ends up being what critics and and people talk about as though you sat down and chose yeah, your subject matter. yeah well, um, I mean, you chose it which is right. so interesting yeah and on some level you do but like if you want to write and you want to like have work in the world and you want to be excited about what you do you, you kind of have to if this is working for you you know if, yeah. if you're finding a vein if you're finding your imagination like captured by this stuff it seems like it would be treasonous to to turn away from it just because you're worried that that it's like gonna seem like you're doing the same thing or or whatever yeah yeah what i always want to say when people write as if writers choose their subject matter like, no, like, do you know how many, like, terrible things writers write choosing the wrong subject matter and experimenting and, like, throwing things away before they arrive at something they can actually do? Like, it's, I feel like there's this ignorance of the process um, in which people think that writers get to choose what they write about because they underestimate how much has to be thrown away. They underestimate how much has to be tried and, and, and fails. Yeah, I mean, it's funny because, like, I think with the book world, I'm so up close to it. But then I remember, you know, I would read like music reviews. Like I grew up reading yeah. Rolling Stone and then Pitchfork yeah. and all this like obsessively. Yeah, and I mean, they, they impose this narrative on a band that but one that one just absorbs where you're like, yeah. well, you know, this like third Walkman album isn't really like an exciting like expansion of their sound or subject matter. And therefore, like it's a six point right. You know, <laughs> um, whereas yeah. like, you know, you're yeah. not going to have the Walkman to kick around forever. And now it's like great that they made six albums that like, you know, kind of did the same thing or whatever. You know, just using them as a random example, you know, but it's like, I don't know. It, it's a funny thing when you, you impose this narrative that is completely set from the outside. Um, yeah. Well, to keep going with our indie rock from the aughts analogies, and I, I love how this has become... Uh, <laughs> The, 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 the source of analogies you've been using. Um, you, sometimes what you do um, is very impressive to me in that you start with a moment where the reader is quite detached from the characters. The reader is at a comic remove. The reader is feeling arched toward the characters. And from that, you zoom into a moment where the identification with the characters is extreme, where we go from the detachment of comedy, right, which I think of as kind of like a wide shot to the close up. Of, of sadness and misery and extreme identification. And I wonder if you do that intentionally, if you think I'm gonna start with something arch and then go to something really sad, um, which any, any self-respecting band of the aughts did quite frequently in, in albums. You think about, <laughs> I, I think a lot about the first Fiery Furnaces record, which goes literally from their most arch song yeah, of course. And it's, Have I mean, we talked like, about how they're like my favorite band of all time? No, but obviously they are. Like, because <laughs> it goes from um, Tropical Icy Land, right? Which is this arch, pretty little song to rub alcohol blues, which is the most devastating, like oh. direct, like on the nose, like I'm in deep shit. Like, and that transition to me is, is what I see you do over and over again in your in your fiction. I mean, that's that's a, a high compliment. Um, and, and I think it happens sort of organically, you know? I, yeah. I think a lot of these things are narratives, narrative devices that one picks up from yeah. from music and film and, and from reading. And I think one of the things that like can drive you crazy about putting together a collection, and I wonder if you feel the same way, is the like, you start to see your own tricks a little bit. Yeah. Like, yeah. You see like, 11 stories lined up and I cut a few out of this book because I saw myself doing the same thing in them in ways that I felt were too obvious to me and therefore had to be obvious to the to the reader that I was sort of like revisiting or reusing certain narrative methods. Um, and, and I think there are just like, I, I really want to think, and again, it's like you can't think too hard about it or else you'll go crazy about like how to disrupt these 
narrative tendencies, you know, um, because like I, I do think I've like figured out things that work for me that I can like get from beginning to middle to end and feel like, oh, that feels like a successful story. Yeah. Um, and then usually I sort of realize like, oh, you set up this character, then you had like a, a second character come in and like do some business in the middle and then there was like a fight at the end uh, or something yeah. <laughs> and like yeah, that's how you got yeah. out of it. Um, yeah. I, th I think, I don't know, do you, do you think about how, because I know you're, you're thinking about projects that feel very different than, than this one, and I don't want to spoil any of them, but like, do you think about ways to disrupt, and all, and you've written a, a, a few books there that are very different from each other, like, do you think about yeah. ways to disrupt one's narrative tendencies, or do you feel like you're, you're able to sort of reset between stories or between projects? Um, I actually try not to think. I really believe in that Otessa Moshvik quotation. This is her own words. I am so dumb when I write. My mind is so dumb when I write, which is actually <laughs> different from I am so dumb, um, which just means I'm putting, I'm putting my mind to bed. And then the next thing she says is very explicitly, she says, I have an internal intellectual asshole. And when I write, I put him to bed where he has a wet dream about his own genius. And I actually think that's a wonderful description of what one must do when one writes. One must put that intellectual asshole to bed and let him, like, you know, go over there. Um, and so it, that would almost be too cerebral to be like, how do I disrupt my own narrative tendencies? It has to come from some less intellectual place. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to ask you a question. And something funny is going to happen, which is I'm going to walk over there and get the cord for my computer because it's running out of battery. But I'm going to do it as you're answering. Um, what I'm wondering is, um, do you feel like there are certain um, uh, things that um, addiction and drugs and recovery give you in your stories that makes you return to them over and over again? I mean, you probably don't do it intentionally, but, but what about that narrative, like the descent and the recovery or, or perhaps it's just part of that um, draws you back, do you think? And now I'm going to get my cord while you answer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that, right, the, the narrative arc part of it is a big part where you sort of have a ready-made story. And I think, like, in some ways, that, that feels to me like as much a sort of inheritance of our previous generation's story arc as, like, the marriage plot used to be. You know what I mean? Like. <laughs> Like we grew up with Jesus's son. We grew yeah, up with- Yeah, I mean, that was like the canonical work that we were raised on, yeah. Um, and like, I don't know, Under the Volcano was one of the first books <laughs> that like totally spoke to me, which says- That's oh, crazy, that really? <laughs> like, I didn't know that book spoke to anybody. <laughs> I, I like, you'll, I, I can, I've got testimony. Like I was in high school and that book changed my life. Like I, oh, cool. I okay. loved it so much. Um, it like felt to me like somebody had like kind of like wedded the like modernist stuff of of Joyce to like something that was like more understandable to me, you know, like sort of like more, I don't know, it felt to me like a combination of like Joyce and Hemingway, which were like my two favorite things. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, but so yeah, I mean, I feel like the addiction narrative was there. Um, and And then I think like a lot of my writing and I think a lot of like uh people probably are still pushing against things like like Kerouac and Hunter yeah. S. Thompson which were like hugely right. important to me um and it feels like only natural that as a result you sort of like romanticize I certainly did romanticize booze and drugs um in a huge way um but then when it comes to like writing about like you know a decade of romanticization <laughs> or more um, you sort of like, A, once you put it down on the page, you realize you're writing about addiction, even if you thought you were just writing about like people drinking right. every 20 right. minutes. Um, yeah. And then you start to reckon with the, the actual consequences, not, not in a, in a preachy way, you know, but like inevitably if you're writing honestly about drugs and alcohol, you're writing about like what it does to people's relationships and what it does to, to one's life, you know? Yeah. Well, it's 7.45 and it looks like there's some questions. So um, Benjamin Quinn, do you want to do you want to give us some of the questions? Hello. Yeah. Okay. Um, and 
so I'm gonna start, we do have a couple questions. I'm happy to receive more though. So I'm gonna start with this question. It was such a delight to hear you both talk about music. So I'm gonna ask the music question, which is what sort of music do you listen to when you write or do you? Ben, do you wanna go first? I'm, I'm actually really interested. Yeah, I don't listen to music while I write, but I stop and procrastinate and play guitar and piano very frequently. And um, it's the way to go from you just started and you're drinking coffee and you're feeling like an intellectual asshole to less of an intellectual asshole. It, it literally is the lullaby that puts your internal intellectual asshole to bed where to use a Tessa's phrase, he goes and has a wet dream about his own genius and leaves you alone. And, um, and so I, I don't listen to music while I write, but music plays that important role. It's funny because I, I'm not a musician. I wish I was, but I know you are. And many of the writers I, I'm friends with are musicians and they often tell me they can't listen to music while they write. And I wonder if that, is, if that has something to do with it. Um, yes. I would say it does. yeah because because you get distracted by it or you feel like it's it's like something that you can't just like put in the background maybe um whereas I I, I listen to music constantly while I work um to the point where like it kind of drives uh, my partner Laura crazy and I have to like um you know um quarantine myself in our small apartment um and it's often but I'll often listen to stuff that I've heard a hundred times you know um or I'll listen, like writing early work, I just listened to like a couple of rap albums like over and over again. And like, there was like a part of me that was like trying to like absorb the vibe of those albums and like sort of like take on a little bit of the like swagger or like some of the, I don't know, attitude or like dexterity um, of those records. I, well, I love the moment in early work where you talk about one character seeking to curb stomp another on intellectual ground. <laughs> so now that you say that, I can see like, oh yeah, like it had I know. Yeah. I try not to be obvious about it, but there's like a lot, a lot of uh, light uh, hip hip hop uh, think thinking uh, yeah. <laughs> in that. Yeah. yeah. Um, also, this is just another quick question. Um, what kind of guitar do you play, Ben? <laughs> I mean, I have it right over here. Um, hold on. Yes, show us the guitar. Um, so there's actually a literary story behind this guitar, which is that Sally Rooney's husband, John, left it in my apartment. And it's, <laughs> um, it's really nice. It's like, I think it might be European and... Um, mm -hmm. Whoa, it's really out of tune, so I'm not going to play it. But um, yeah, it's just like a really simple um, acoustic. Uh, and I have the action set really low. Um, but um, you know, when, when I was in a band, I wasn't a guitar player. I was a, I was a keyboard player. Um, and um, I, still, uh, I still think of, um, I think I still think about things that keyboard players think about, like starting out with a rhythm and then putting a minor chord on it and then a major chord on it. I mean, that's what guitar players who are really good at picking think about too. Like Elliot Smith thought about guitar that way, was able to keep that in his head that way, but I can certainly. Great, so um, here's a question. I'll ask this one next. Um, it was interesting to hear you both speak about rewriting endings. Does it feel in the end that you're writing towards the ending that you chose all along that some part of you knew it, but it was hiding from you? Mm. That there's one true ending, I guess. It's a little, it's a little mystical for me. Um, <laughs> you know, like I, I think like there is I don't know. Well, sometimes you feel kind of mystical while you're writing, but I guess there's a difference between like, to, you know, turning off one's conscious thought and like sort of believing that they're, that you're like moving towards something. But when I'm thinking about it intellectually, I would say like, I, I don't really believe in this like sort of, uh, there was always, there was always going to be an ending. Like if I had just given up and decided to like, try to publish you know I could have I probably could have like gotten the Christopher Kids published with its original bad ending um and that would have probably been the end of it um it would have been such a loss like that would have been yeah 
Um, but it's but it's this funny thing. Like, do do you think that there's like there's there's the one true, one one true answer? To a story, yeah. I mean, I mean, sadly, I think often I read a story that's been published, and it's what you just described. Like, it got accepted somewhere with its ending that was ten endings away from the right ending. Mm -hmm. um, that someone, ex yeah, I think Saunders actually put this very well once, which is that he said there are endings that have the formal qualities of an ending without the spiritual qualities of endings. Oh, that's and so I think good. that's exactly right. Um, that it's really easy to fool yourself when something looks like an ending, talks like an ending, whatever, um, and just doesn't quite have that, um, you know, punch in the gut or laughter or whatever you might be looking for. And the people who are really great at writing endings, Amy Baradale is an unsung master of the ending. Oh, um, their endings don't really make sense. Um, the ending of William Way. Uh, yeah, why does that ending work? What's the yeah. line? Like, I, I, I'm sure it changed my life or something. Like yeah, that. yeah. They're just coming down from acid and she says, for some reason, yeah. So it's something like, it's something very banal. And then there's another story where she's um, at a Buddhist retreat and she's just talking to an older woman who's vaguely based on Renata Adler, it seems. Vaguely. <laughs> and that woman says, um, is talking to her about another woman at their retreat. And she, the main character says, yeah, I'd like to stab Cheryl in the chest. And it ends there, <laughs> you know, which is, which is a wonderful, like it shows someone getting to a more honest place. It does dramatize something. It does show a therapeutic moment between this young woman and her mentor. Um, but it certainly doesn't have what we would identify as like the standard formal characteristics of an ending. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, so here's a question. Um, so you both wrote uh, write stories that are interconnected, but also interested in topics of relationships and community. When writing a fraternity, for instance, what comes first? Do you craft characters who are fully embodied and then figure out how to push them together? Or do you try to figure out what kinds of people fit together best? Um, what I think I do is find out who a character is as, as I'm writing. Like when I, for example, the first story in my collection is called God and it's written from the perspective of a closeted gay narrator who's a frat boy in a frat who hasn't admitted his sexuality to himself. He's, he's concealing it from himself for, for much of the story. And I only figured that out about him, I don't know, a couple pages in. I was like, oh, this guy is in love with this other guy and he's not admitting it to himself. Um, and so I, I, it's very unintentional with me. I only can listen to the characters and, and find out who they are. Um, and if I'm lucky, like I, I learn more and more um, as I go. Um, but I also find that um, I can kind of start to uh, enter their mindset by describing the physical particularities um, of their environment, by describing the objects they have around them, by describing their apartments or houses that stuff always kind of like starts to show me their mind because by showing how someone perceives the world, you are showing how their mind works. And you might not even know you're doing it, but it's the way they perceive and what they notice and don't notice that eventually reveals to you who they are. Yeah. Great. So here is a question for you, Andrew, um, from Daniel in the audience. Was the love interest in Cool for America a Leslie prototype? <laughs> Uh, I think that's one of those things where like I definitely realized I mean I think like in a in a um, actual um, timeline sense yes she was I wrote that the story cool for America is the is the very first story of any of the stories in that collection so it predates um, early work and and everything else and and the stories with Leslie in them um, and so I think that was the first of like many almost every story in this book is about, uh, you know, like a, an interesting woman who is like far more interesting than the man who is interested in her um, and the various ways in which they come together or are kept apart from each other. Um, and I think the reason that like the, I named the collection that besides the fact that I, I think it's like a, a cool title um, it is because I do feel like that that story feels sort of like the like er story, the sort of like 
prototype, as you say, um, f for a certain dynamic that plays out throughout the book and, and in both books, honestly. Um, this like sort of funny push pull of attraction and difficulty between um, characters. Great. And then similarly on the on the topic of women, um, when you were writing from the perspective of women, how do you make sure you were doing an accurate or um, pathetic representation? You want to start, Ben? Sure. Um, you know, um, in fraternity, I only wrote one story from the perspective of a woman and all the rest are from the perspective of men. But what I've been writing um, since during COVID um, has all been from the perspective of a woman. And I don't think it's something I have any control over. I think it's that I was so isolated and so in need of someone to talk to that I created the person I wanted to talk to in some sense. And then whether that character fails and is a success of empathy or a failure of empathy um, depends on my ability to totally persuade myself via obsession. And sometimes you try to write a character of the opposite sex and you can't bridge the divide between the experiences of men and women. The system of gender is too all encompassing. Um, and sometimes that kind of benign obsession sees you through just that absolute need to keep imagining everything about a person, um, even if they don't exist. Yeah. I mean, the question about accuracy is really interesting because I do, I think it happens all the time it is when I read student work and like sort of less frequently, but still sometimes if you read published work that really gets either cross gender stuff wrong or cross cultural stuff wrong. A thing I see the most with students is like them writing like a an old person and they're always just so sad, <laughs> like like the very sad 70 year old man feeding the birds, you know, <laughs> like who's just like so sad about his life and his, how yeah. his grandchildren won't talk to him. Um, and you're like, surely 70 year old people think about like something besides their grandchild not, not being nice to them. Um, but I think like, I mean, on, on a like practical level, I, I do, like my reader, my like sort of small intimate reader circle includes women and is like kind of heavily weighted towards women just by luck of the draw. Um, and I do think, I mean, I've never really gotten the note because I've, I've also like, I think like tried to teach myself not to like make the very obvious mistakes that you see or like mistakes or just like sort of the, the you know, like the classic student thing is like, a male writer, she looked at herself in the mirror, like she was looking pretty good today, like her lips were full and red, you know, like that, that kind of shit, or, you know, just like, always noting that, like, whether one is like having one's period or not, or something where you're just like, that is not like the, what you know, um, and so, I don't know, I think like, I ordered a cranberry soda, because I was having a UTI. Right, it's like, yeah. no, that's yeah. not, uh, yeah. and so I think like, I don't know, having someone vet things it is useful, not in the sense of like, can you check this for me, woman? Yeah. But you know, just like having that be a part of your world of readers for whatever kinds of characters you're writing about seems useful. Like, <laughs> Yeah. Um, I mean, what I often tell my students is don't think of this person as a man, don't think of this person as a woman, think of them as an individual because what they very often do is, is like commit this exercise, which I think is a, they attempt this exercise, which I think is committing an error, where they say, how would a man regard this situation? How would a woman regard this situation? Am I getting what a man would think right? Am I getting what a woman would think right? And I think as soon as you start to do that, you're lost. Yeah, and I think it's a fault of my own writing in general that it's like not super embodied. Like the characters, like you don't, you, you wouldn't really know what most of these characters look like. Like there, there's a few instances where someone, the first person narrator will describe the person he's looking at or she's looking at. But um, I think this can be almost be a strength in this case because it's like, I just don't think that much about those things and just think in terms of consciousness and also sort of like maybe in the Otessa way of like banishing one's intellectual self, just assume for the sake of writing, not intellectually that like we kind of think the same, just like we're the same, 
like for the sake of this exercise, like we're the same men and women think exactly the same and don't worry about it. And then like, it's not a problem. Don't overthink it maybe is part of, part of what I'm yeah. mostly what I'm saying. Yeah, but I'm also like you and that I had a writing group during the writing of fraternity that was super important to me. That was two men and two women. And I think like, I think I would have been lost without that as well. So it can't yeah. just be intuition, I agree. Yeah. Great, so we have time for just one more quick question and I'll end with um, an attendee who's looking for just a book recommendation. In the interest of time, I'll just limit you both to one. <laughs> Maybe. Okay, how about just what are you currently reading that you would recommend, if you are? Um, do you want to start, Andrew? Um, yeah, I'm reading this really great Gary Indiana book called Do Everything in the Dark which is one of his like more, more obscure books. Um, but I've become a, a Gary Indiana super fan and I just really love almost all of his fiction and, and also criticism that I've read. Um, I would highly recommend uh, Horse Crazy as like a starting point with his fiction. It's a novel about um, the eighties in New York and um, about like romantic obsession in the, in the time of AIDS. And so like, there's a lot of anxiety obviously about sex and um, it's just a really funny, like really hardcore book. Um, and this book is sort of like that same milieu, like 20 years later as they all have gotten older and have experienced a lot of death and a lot of, some have been successful, some haven't. And it's sort of like a patchwork uh, ensemble book about these uh, artistic people in, in New York and beyond. Um, I recently finished a book by someone who I think is a friend of Gary Indiana's, Chris Krauss, uh, called Torpor. Um, but since, and it was great also, I think for many of the reasons you just described, it's like, um, it's so much about the power dynamics of romance and, and uh, the backdrop of the AIDS era. But um, I just started reading volume two of Proust, and that's embarrassing to admit, because why haven't I before? But I will say um, on a lighter note that um, going back to early work, Andrew, after reading a bit of Proust, I was like, oh, like I can see how Proust, how important Proust must be to you. And it never occurred to me that there was any Proustian connection when I first read early work. It's not derivative. It doesn't feel like someone copying Proust. I wish it was. <laughs> Once I knew that you loved Proust, I was like, ah, this is like a Proustian attention to the details of people's houses, to their ways of, their families' ways of making money, um, their gestures, the minutia. All of it was very closely observed in a Proustian fashion. I think for like the last five years until like earlier this year, I was reading Proust all the time. And so I think it, it started seeping into, <laughs> it started seeping into everything. Yeah. I love that that Proust and um, and gangster rap appear to have been like the two, uh, <laughs> the binary that 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 brought early work into being. These are the, the two things I maybe love most in the world. Yeah. Well, that is an excellent place to end with Proust and gangster rap. Thank you both so much for this amazing conversation. Um, I just want to take a moment to thank our wonderful speakers and all of you for spending your evening with us and showing up for authors, publishers, indie book selling, and our incredible staff here at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. Please make sure to check out Cool for America and Fraternity at the links in the chat or visit our website. Thanks again for your time and your support and for spending your evening with us. Have a great night, everyone, and thank you so much and stay well. Thanks so much, Ben. Thanks, Ben. Thank both. Thanks, yeah, thanks Andrew. Thanks, everyone. Everyone else. All right. Be well, guys.